I am Jasmine Tool. I'm the Soils Technical Lead and Knowledge Exchange Coordinator on the CHC Food Project. And today our two speakers are Ian Shield, who is an experienced agronomist. He is the head of long-term experiments and agronomy, and he is the chair of the Farm and Field Experiments Committee at Rothamsted. And our second speaker is Dr. Nathan Morris, who is a soils and crop specialist at NIAB, and he runs several long-term experiments across East Anglia, including the STAR and Saxmundum Experimental Trial. So to start with, if I can pass over to Ian for your presentation, please. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I will see if I can share my screen. Is that showing for everybody? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Yeah, so a um, little bit of an imposter here. I'm, uh, I'm presenting the, the initial slides introducing the project on behalf of Lydia, uh, who unfortunately can't be with us this afternoon. Um, so we have a little uh, uh, introduction to this project the Centre for High Carbon Capture Cropping. Um, it's a fairly big project uh, with uh, a lot of partners involved. It's funded by DEFRA uh, and the Farming Futures, and uh, it, it encompasses um, crops, soils, and uses and end, end value in, in those crops in terms of capturing carbon. The list of partners is long. <laughs> um, there are, I think, I think it was the 22, somebody said, quite a management task for uh, those managing the project, a um, big group. The uh, project is split into work packages and you can see there the different cropping types that are involved. Um, we're here today talking about cover crops uh, specifically, and uh, certainly in what I mentioned, there will be a bit of tillage. Um, we've got the fibre crops, perennial, uh, perennial cropping uh, for food, feed and forage. And then we also have uh, perennial cropping for biomass. Uh, soils covers the, everything really, because we're looking at carbon in soils across all the different cropping types. Um, and there's a, there's a bit of crop genetic improvement for some of the the normal crops that are in, the, in there. Um, and of course, uh, the, the overall objective to be a knowledge hub uh, for these, these uh, ideas and concepts for carbon, carbon capture on farms. So the cover crops that we're, we're talking about today, this, this is a, a general slide that uh, for, the, for the project and you know, there's, there's a lot of questions to be asked um, as to whether it's worthwhile, should you do it, should you not? Um, and so many factors involved in making that decision. Um, what the use would be, would it justify the expense and the additional work of establishing these crops? Um, and does it fit in the rotation? Um, and will it do harm to the crops? That are making the money or hopefully making the money <laughs> not always um, so we are doing some work to address these questions um, and we can give you a, a flavor of what we're doing uh, not always we not, not promising answers um, i'm just able to show you what we're doing to to try and start to address a few of these things so uh, importantly, if you want to make contact with the project, if you want to follow what's happening with the project, um, there's, the, there's an email address to actually get in contact. There's a website to, uh, to follow things and you can sign up for the newsletter and keep keeping yourself informed of events such as today's uh, webinar. And that's only part of a series on uh, 
you know, many subjects across the project. So um, plenty of ways to keep in touch and keep, keep yourself informed as to what's happening. So moving on, uh, Rothamsted's contribution to this uh, comes from something which <laughs> it got a working title and nobody ever bothered to, uh, to give it any other title. So it is called the Large Scale Rotation Experiment, uh, but it does cover, as you'll see in a moment, more than just crop rotations. Um, and obviously it has a cover crop component. Uh, we're doing it on two sites. This one is at uh, Broom's Barn uh, near Borough St. Edmunds, Suffolk. Uh, and that's on a fairly light sandy, sandy loam. Um, and then our main site at Hartenden in Hertfordshire, uh, somewhat heavier soil and silty clay. So we've got the contrasting soil types uh, there, but not, not really contrasting in, in terms of weather conditions or anything such, just soil. So the, the crop rotation aspect, there's three crop rotations. Uh, a very simple one, just two weeks and rape. Um, a five year rotation, which, which uh, diversifies a little bit with, with uh, a spring legume, a spring cereal. Uh, and then something that's somewhat more out there a little bit more adventurous and see what changes we can make uh, by introducing it to your lay as it was. Uh, that has now been replaced with uh, to your legume fallow um, to uh, just lengthen the rotation, increase the diversity and see where we can go uh, with that. It is, the whole thing is a systems approach. So you don't, you don't study and get results which indicate in any one activity. You can see there, there are organic amendments added to these, these plots, which of course will also have an effect on soil carbon um, and the cover cropping, which comes pretty much every time you have a spring crop coming up in the rotation. And of course, the two-year legume fallow could be seen as a cover crop. Depends how you how you want to make your definition of, of a cover crop. Um, two cultivation regimes over the top of that. Um, with all these treatments, it's um, they're all combinations are present in all years, so it's uh, it's what's called fully factorial. Um, Thorough soil disturbance still using a plow and zero till or as close to zero till as we can get, uh, admitting that we do on occasion have a bit of soil movement. Below that, uh, what we call a second level of treatments, as I said, we've got the, uh, the organic amendment, which is a compost brought in, uh, compost going on uh, just once in the two shorter rotations, twice in the longer rotation. We have an aspect of smart crop protection, which is something, a uh, program that was running at Rotham State for several years uh, as this piece of work began. Uh, we won't go into detail of that today. That's, that's another piece of uh, something we could talk about and have a webinar on its own. So the, the cover cropping in the five-year rotation, um, we're keeping it simple. Um, it's for Celia and uh, black oat. We didn't want to put brassicas into a five-year rotation, which included oil seed rape. So we left it out. Um, in the seven-year rotation where we don't grow oil seed rape, uh, we have brought in three different fodder radishes, a much more complex uh, cover crop mixture there with a clover. Um, there's a vetch, two legumes going in there, um, black oak again, and, and niger. As I said, we did start with the two-year grass lay. Um, we've moved away from that now, and we're in the two-year legume fallow, um, and we have four legumes in there. We've got lucerne, white clover, yellow trefoil, and greater bird's foot trefoil. Um, 
which makes quite quite a nice mix um, for that one. So, as you might imagine, we draw in all the different disciplines uh, to make studies uh, of very specific aspects. <clears throat> soil microbiologists very interested in how the soil microbiome is changing uh, or potentially changing as time goes by with these uh, different treatments applied, uh, soil penetration resistance, and also things like bulk density, of course, with uh, zero tillage or minimal, absolute minimal tillage and thorough soil cultivation. And of course, lots of soil cores to keep a track on soil carbon and the basics, you know, nutrition and pH, as it's a long-term experiment that needs, uh, needs that constant monitoring for the usual. Um, soil seed bank being uh, assessed by um, uh, the germination method in the glass house, uh, see what we're doing to, we obviously uh, we're recording wheat populations that are uh, visible that have germinated in the crop uh, and also looking at the seed bank. Uh, that's, that's a plot of the penetration resistance on the right at Broom's Farm, showing a fairly, fairly dense, hard to penetrate layer at about 40 centimetres, but doesn't seem to be having a serious effect on, on productivity. Um, importantly, uh, the first set of carbon results, soil, soil carbon results, uh, showed no significant differences. I mean, it could be awkward <laughs> if you hadn't even really imposed any treatments and you find, find there's a difference anyway. Uh, so that's the first set of results. Then the uh, following results are still awaited. Um, very interesting to see what changes we get and how fast they may come about. Um, it's, it's obviously a, a, not an instant effect trying to, to build up soil carbon. So, you know, the prediction is that hopefully um, zero till, certainly in the longer rotations, will, will uh, build up carbon. A um, little bit negative there on the three year, whether that might stay the same, it may go up with zero till, we'll see how that goes. Um, so one of the questions that a lot of people ask, of course, is, is worms. Uh, very interesting, both with zero till and with the addition of cover crops. So this is after only one year of running, uh, running the treatments, and we're already starting to see some differences. I think particularly interesting is on the right-hand side that just from the first year of using a cover crop, uh, we have a statistically significant difference uh, with more worms. This is total worms. They were split into, into different types, but um, this is just total for a quick, quick look-see. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variation there on the left-hand side um, with the cultivation and the rotations. So uh, nothing too much we can say there. Um, we'll see if they're they're going to continue to rise with zero tillage, or maybe not. Um, it's all there to be to be found out, and that that's all I have to to say at the moment. Thank you, Ian. Um, Nathan, are you ready? Yeah, I'll just share my screen we'll now. Okay, can everybody see my screen? We can so, see you in produce mode. Uh, is that better? Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so I was just going to um, do a little bit of an overview on how I see and some of the um, research that has been going on in the UK around cover crops and their use within 
um, farming systems and building a resilient farming system. So I thought I would just start with what do I mean by a resilient farming system? Um, and I think with the late, more recent rather um, changes in, in weather patterns and the intensity of, of rainfall, um, more extreme conditions in terms of periods of dry, um, periods of heat um, has increased very much our challenges around uh, crop production um, and therefore any way we can look at trying to build resilience into our system be that through what I've put here is some things like healthy soils so as we've just been discussing trying to build soil organic matter in the soils trying to improve the soil structure to a drainage um, increasing biodiversity so we've perhaps we can be a bit rely less reliant on inputs for um, pest control. Um, there's a big, obviously, um, emphasis at the moment around our water quality um, and trying to keep up, keep the water um, as clean for um, drinking water and other uses. Um, and then there's building the climate resilience. Um, and, and more importantly, I've put it last, but it really shouldn't be last, but it's maintaining profitable farming systems as well. So, and I thought the diagram on the right is quite a nice way of summarising how all those integrate together. So cover crops are ICB, uh, can be part of that, um, but by no means they should be seen in isolation. Um, these farming systems are always, uh, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle of those jigsaw pieces fitting together um, to make that system. So I thought I'd just do a very brief review, and there was a very um, a good review done with AHDB a few years back um, that looked at uh, all the information that was available at the time in terms of cover crops, what they basically can do in terms of potential benefits, and there's a very long list there, I won't go through them all there, but certainly things um, around um, nitrogen um, fixing and uptake, um, minimising losses to water, um, soil erosion and um, cover, soil cover is very important, particularly over winter months, to reduce that runoff and loss um, to water courses and the general um, improvement in the soil health and soil structure around those roots um, and, and obviously earthworm activity um, and just building those, those sort of blocks, if you like, for improving our resilience. There are, of course, challenges as well with cover crops. Um, and these are just a few. I'm sure there are others as well. Um, but there are obviously challenges, particularly around um, rotational use of cover crops and how those might implicate on our on our cash crops in terms of green bridges, um, potential weed challenges as well. Um, how we manage volunteers as well in the following crops, um, and obviously some of those management issues, um, particularly around. Um, both um, destruction of cover crops and the establishment of following crops um, on heavier soils can be um, more of a challenge than on our lighter soils. And of course, as we've all just uh, heard from Ian, that, that, that there is an increase in terms of cost and workload with additional operations for establishing uh, cover crops. Um, and the benefits are not always immediate. And I've got some results that will just hopefully show that in a bit more detail. So as I mentioned, cover crops are certainly a very uh, important um, part of our farming system, but of course they do add complexity. And again, I quite like this, this uh, graphic that just showed just some of the perhaps um, decision-making thoughts that might need to be adopted if we're considering using cover crops in our farming systems. So things like how long do we want the cover crop in the, in the um, soil for, um, the cost of both the seed and the establishment, um, compatibility within our farming system so in terms of soil type in terms of our crop rotations so there's a number of considerations there we do know from research that cover crops are very good at um, basically keeping nitrogen out of water and this was just some examples from various um, studies that have been done over the years with a number of species there's obviously not an exhaustive list there are others um, but there are good examples here of just how much nitrogen can be taken up over, this is typical, what we say, over winter. So that sort of typical period, post-harvest, cover crop established in sort of mid-August onwards. Um, and then over that autumn, winter period before spring crop, 
um, where where the ground could be um, left bare um, and be more at risk from, from nitrogen loss. So having a cover crop with a root system that's able to take up that nitrogen and keep it out of the water can be very beneficial. And you can see there at the bottom, we've got two brassicas, both white mustard and oilseed, rad oilseed radish. Um, both of those are particularly good at, at taking up nitrogen out of the, out of the soil. Um, nitrogen release obviously is a bit more complicated um, and that will be a separate discussion um, but uh, there are there are differences in in terms of when those release uh, characteristics occur and it's partly driven from the carbon nitrogen ratio of, of the of the material or the species grown so essentially material that has higher lignin um, so example rye actually has quite a high lignin um, content and the CN ratio is also quite high and that essentially degrades and, and breaks down more slowly. Therefore, the release of nitrogen um, can, can be slower than some of the other examples. For example, those brassicas, which tend to have lower CN ratios. But as I said, they are um, cover crops can be very useful at picking up nitrogen. Um, and keeping it out of the water. And there was some really good um, work done as part of a, a DEFRA project that was a, um, the demonstration test catchment project that had a number of different catchments across the country. Um, the one I've just got here as an example is from the Wensum, which is in Norfolk. Um, and that was led by the University of East Anglia, where they had very, very um, good monitoring using kiosks to look at water quality. Uh, over a, a catchment of a, of a farm. So it was a number of fields on farm that they monitored under different management regimes. So with cover crops, with different types of cultivation to look at the water quality in terms of uh, in here in the blue, the sort of middle bar is the, is the nitrate data. Um, the top um, bars are the rainfall and then the bottom lines in red are the phosphorus. Um, content, but the nitrogen is very clear to see the benefits from cover crops at really lowering the risk of, of losses to water. And in this study, there was a um, 75 to 97% reduction relative to a plough based approach um, in reducing nitrate losses. Um, the phosphate wasn't as clear. There was um, not such a strong link with, with the use of cover crops, but the nitrogen was, was particularly um, good at doing, at keeping the water clean. Cover crops are also uh, very good with, with rooting and rooting obviously is really important both for sort of um, stru soil structuring, but also sequestering carbon in that soil as well. Um, and this is an example from a study from a PhD student who was looking at one of the long-term studies that NIAB um, managed um, down at um, in Suffolk, this is the Sustainable Trial and Arable Rotations project that's now in its 19th year. And um, we were looking at how different management in terms of cultivation and rotation could influence the structure of the soil. So the student looked at two rotations, so that was continuous wheat and alternate fallow, and then looked at three cultivations. So plough, uh, deep non-inversion, which was about 250 millimetres depth, and then shallow non-inversion that was about 100 millimetres depth, and then used the various measures, um, soil measures, things like penetration resistance, bulk densities, to look at um, the structure of the soil and took cores down to a metre that then were processed using X-ray chromatography to look at the um, pore network. And that's what I just wanted to give an example here. So here are some examples of, of those, um, those images and these are under different. So we've got shallow, deep uh, and plough as our cultivation approaches. CWW is continuous winter wheat. And then the uh, ALTCC is the alternate cover crop. And then you can see there the difference in the poor networks, um, particularly striking really is between the, the plough alternate cover crop with quite large pores, but not very many of them. Um, compared to shallow cultivation with the alternate cover crop where you've got that very, very fine network of pores and that interconnectivity really helps with um, drainage, um, the rooting ability, um, and hopefully in terms of uh, access to both nutrients and uh, water for crops as well. Um, another example that's just looking at building resilience into a system is a piece of work that's undertaken at Morley in Norfolk. 
um, and it's funded by the Morley Research uh, Agricultural Foundation and the JC Mann Trust. And it's been running since 2007 and it's what we call the New Farming Systems Cultivation Experiment. And it has two main factors that we're looking at. So cultivation, so we have four levels of cultivation from plough being the most intensive through to deep and then shallow non-inversion and a managed regime, which is basically adapting to the uh, conditions um, and also the management history in terms of any grass weeds or other factors that, that farmers would do. And that's very much an example of how farmers will react um, to the conditions rather than just being absolute to, uh, to a single type of cultivation. And then on top of that, we have two management approaches. So we have current, which is basically following a, a winter cereal based rotation. Uh, and then we have one that's um, a cover crop. So again, winter cereals, but when we have the spring breaks, we follow that with a, a cover crop. And you can see there over the period of time, we've actually had a number of iterations of cover crops. And that's particularly interesting when we start to look at the performance. So this is just comparing, this is um, percentage of yield response um, to, to the cover crop in two of the tillage. So they've sort of picked out the extreme cultivation. So we've got plough tillage and we've got shallow tillage. Um, plough tillage, you can see there, and this is, again, the bars are not in date order. They are actually ranked in response order from the least to the most. But you can see there that plough tillage, generally, we don't see a response to the cover crop. And that's essentially because the cultivation um, is actually doing that structuring of the soil compared to in shallow tillage, where obviously we're minimizing that disturbance with a, with a cultivator. We're actually getting the benefit from those roots uh, in the cover crops. Um, and therefore we, we see that response to the cover crop uh, in more years than not. If we delve into that a little bit more detail, and I uh, apologize, this is quite a detailed slide, but I think it's worth just, just spending a little bit of time just to look at the interactions between the different cultivations um, and the response. So this is yield as a percentage of control. And the control is essentially the plough without the cover crop. So I basically look at each yield in every year and say the plough without a cover crop is 100%. And then I look at the other yields as a relative percentage uh, response to that. So we can see that, that um, where we've got deep and shallow um, cultivations, we do see a slight drop in performance on average um, compared to ploughing. Where we have cover crops, again, with the shallow cultivation, we see a, without a cover crop, we do see a, a drop in yield performance. With a cover crop, we start to see a bit of a build up across the whole period of, of, the, of the rotation. But you can see there from the range of, res of responses, we can see there that actually the um, both the cultivation in terms of non-inversion tillage and the use of cover crops can actually increase that variability over the over the period of the of the ten years that that uh, this is data has been looking at. But that perhaps hides some of the issues that actually, if we look into the data a bit more, we actually start to see where those responses are coming. So we can pull out essentially the years that the winter wheat, and we can actually see that winter wheat is a very robust crop. We don't see much of a, an effect from um, the rotation or the cultivation, uh, apart from where we've got the shallow non-inversion without the cover crop, but the other, um, both deep uh, with or without cover crop and the shallow with a cover crop give very similar to performance to a plough-based system. We can also look at the same data, but in terms of periods. So I've basically looked at the data from years two to six. So essentially the early years of when the um, cover crops have been used. Um, and then I compared that to the latter years of the study. So years two to six of the first five year periods, and then years nine to 13 of the latter five years. And we can see what's really interesting there, how there was a drop initially with the deep and shallow, and particularly where cover crops were used, there was a drop in the performance. But in the latter years, we've really seen those picking up and becoming much more comparable to the plow base system. So again, we were talking about the use of cover crops and that basically to build a resilient system, actually it's that re re repeated use of them in the rotation where we start to see those longer term benefits. We can obviously look at margins, because again, as I mentioned at my beginning of the presentation, financial performance and the, and the um, profitability of a farm enterprise is really important. 
And we can see here again, obviously there is a cost associated with a cover crop um, and particularly where you've got um, the, 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 the additional costs associated with establishing those, we do see some drop in margin. Um, although the, the shallow, again, the shallow cultivation with cover crop um, does with the yield performance improving, obviously that helps with that return. Um, and when we look at the actual support payments that hopefully can be used to support the use of cover crop establishment and, and seed cost, we can see actually we're, we're pulling ahead a bit in terms of margin performance. One last thing I wanted to cover, because I think it's quite an interesting thing, um, and it's a slightly different way of looking at data compared with just um, the, the sort of yield or margin output. Um, we can actually derive how much energy is required per tonne of production. So we call it the energy input ratio. And this was done in, with um, kindly by some colleagues at the University of Hertfordshire. And this is just a brief summary of essentially we derive both direct and indirect inputs um, and look at the energy associated with those mater materials. Uh, and then we look at the energy input ratio, which is basically the uh, division of um, essentially a uh, plough based approach in the given year against whatever other comparator is. So for example, the non-inversion with or without the cover crop to look at the, that effect. So here we've got the, the ratio. So again, we've used plough as our, as our control without the cover crop. So that, that ratio is one. So um, it gives us a performance or so anything above one essentially requires more energy to get a ton of output anything below one is actually a more efficient way of, of getting that, that output than a plow-based system. Um, we can see here that the years from 2008 through to 2020 have, have seen on the left there with the particular crop. The spring cropping is highlighted in blue and we can see there in the early years we've highlighted the ratios that are above one in pink or red and you can see there that there's quite a lot of predominance of those of those higher values, particularly uh, in the um, use of cover crops, those those you know, essentially the extra operations of the cover crops um, didn't actually give us that that redu reduction in, in energy ratios early on. But as the rotation progressed over time and more iterations of cover crops were used, we can see those numbers turning to, 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 to green. So actually, over the longer term, we see improved performance with lower energy required um, and you can see there quite nicely the, 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 the performance of the shallow non-inversion, giving some really good um, performance based on um, the energy required per tonne of production. So we might get a very slightly lower yield, but we actually improve our energy efficiency of the system. And the last bottom lines on, these, uh, on this table are the looking at um, the rotation, either with or without um, the winter wheat years in, in either from 2010 onwards or from 2015 onwards. And again, it's just to see that shift over time that we saw with the yield that obviously we see actually coming through um, when we calculate the energy input ratio. So we can see there that the deep non-inversion with cover crop in the early years was actually giving us a ratio just slightly above uh, one. But in the latter years, we've actually seen that drop below one. And that improvement seems to have occurred over those those latter years of the of the uh, study. So just a few messages I wanted just to highlight um, in terms of how we use cover crops to build resilience. And as I mentioned, cover crops can really be beneficial in terms of providing um, nitrogen uptake, erosion control, soil structural benefits. We need to be probably uh, quite specific on our objectives and consider the rotational impacts and therefore choose our species that we want uh, within our rotations carefully. Um, in terms of the covers, uh, the cover crops, the recovery of nitrogen can be anywhere between 25 and 90 kilos of N, and that's at current fertilizer prices can be worth up to hundred pounds a hectare. We've seen improvement in soil structure and pool connectivity that cover crops can um, add additionally to, to a, a system, particularly in conjunction with tillage approaches as well, with looking at moving um, less soil disturbance. Um, and then the longer term yield improvement, yield stability, 
and lower energy inputs per ton of production is, is again something that does take time it's not something that changes very quickly but over the course of rotations you start to see so my main message really is that cover crops are an investment across the rotation and that cover crops are part of really building a resilient farming system but must not be seen in isolation they must be part of, of that holistic approach to um, cultivation um, increasing crop diversity um, improving soil structure through maybe a use of amendments etc so thank you very much thank you nathan if anybody has any questions feel free to put your hand up or put them in the chat um but i will go ahead with a couple so one for ian is what depth are you measuring your soil organic carbon to was that depth yeah yeah uh to one meter so it's split into the plow layer because historically even the the, uh, the zero till was ploughed until recently. Plow layer, and then plow layer down to 60 centimetres, and then 60 to the metre, yeah. Okay, great. And also, how do the baseline soil organic carbon levels for your two sites compare with a typical arable rotation on the same soil type? Um, I would say they're pretty much in line because they were in in the typical rotation um, until we laid out an experiment on top. So those baselines are um, are what the the previous rotation had given us, and uh, yeah, they're they're pretty much in line. So they'd be a bit higher. The data on there was from Brooms Barn. They'd be higher at uh, Harbenden. Obviously, the higher clay content at Hartenden allows that soil to hold on to more carbon than the sandy loam. Um, but uh, yeah, fairly typical. Thank you. We've had a question in the chat from Ian Wilkinson for Nathan, and it's, are you monitoring earthworms as a part of your work? So can you just repeat that question? That's right. Are you monitoring earthworms as a part of your work like Ian? So we, we have been, we've done um, some some um, measurements. We're, we've learned that obviously there is quite a um, a driver from, from the conditions at the time. So it's a sandy loam soil at, uh, at Morley. And um, that can be, depending on the conditions, um, so essentially the seasonal effect can be a bigger effect than the actual treatments effect. But we do, yeah, we do look at earthworms and we do see a general trend to not always statistically significant, but a general trend to uh, higher numbers in the lower disturbance systems. Not necessarily such an effect from the cover crops, but the species we've used not necessarily ones that have very high biomass. Um, and therefore, that might influence a little bit about uh, how much effect that would then have on earthworm numbers. Um, but we do certainly see a general increase in earthworms and particularly when we look at the, uh, the sort of species of worms so not just total numbers but actually what we say the functional groups um, we do then start to see differences in in terms of those those species present because of that uh, cover that cover crops and and therefore food supply that those cover crops offer yeah thank you and then another question is, is there anything that could be done to reduce the variability seen in the year-to-year -year benefit from having cover crops in the rotation? For that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think that's that's one of the things, I guess, as, as researchers and scientists, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of working on in terms of, of getting additional data so we can really learn where, where actual things work. But it is challenging because obviously um, seasonal differences and also our diverse cropping and climatic conditions in the UK actually mean even if we're you know doing an intensive um, monitoring at uh, long term monitoring on certain experimental sites, it's not necessarily going to be the same on all farms in all scenarios. So it, it becomes a little bit more tricky. But yeah, I do see, as I say, use of cover crops being part of, of the system. I think we've got to be careful not to put too much reliance on just cover crops. 
if we are looking to build resilient systems and, and trying to reduce that variability, we've got to look at our, our cropping systems in terms of rotation, um, the cultivations, um, use of, of, of maybe integrating livestock if we can. I know that's not always easy. Um, mm -hmm. but there, there are, you know, it's, it's just like one of those, one of the tools in, in the toolbox. But trying to integrate them all obviously does take more more um, management and time to actually get them together. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question for Ian. How do you decide which species to include in your mixtures? Yeah, I mean, it could have been so many things. Um, the uh, more complex mixture um, in the longer rotation was actually um, it was available. It was um, it was marketed at the time when we first picked it up, um, and we thought it looked interesting. It's since been withdrawn. We can't actually get it anymore, so we're having to to mix it up ourselves now, just for continuity to keep the mix the same um, it's quite complex and that's an interesting question do you need to have that many different species in there um, the, the work will not address that uh, it is only looking at a really quite diverse cover crop and it's only looking at that in combination with the other factors so in line with that rotation being diverse, we picked a diverse um, uh, cover crop mixture. And in line with the, the shorter five-year rotation being less diverse, we picked a less diverse um, uh, mixture for the cover crop. And as I said, uh, you know, keeping brassicas out of the cover crop while we're growing our seed rate, just for a little bit of safety. Jasmine's still there. Has she frozen? Maybe she's frozen. Yeah. Are there any? Yeah. There's there's another question that seems to be uh, towards uh, aimed at me, which is good. So uh, there's one that's um, basically asking if there are certain cover crops that would have uh, more benefits towards arable farmers uh, with control of things like black grass and pests such as flea beetle. Um, and that's yeah. I think at the moment we're probably still learning. Um, I think there certainly are in terms of black grass control. If you are on very heavy soils with a predominant for black grass, then we have to do do think carefully about how to integrate cover crops into those rotations. Um, something that's particularly um, with, with black grass um, is challenging if you're if you've got a very thick cover crop because you want to try and suppress the black grass and um you can end up with a challenge of then when you come to destroy that cover crop that essentially the cover crop's actually just shielding the the surface where the black grass is uh and the, and you have to end up with potentially several applications if you are destroying with glyphosate which is still uh the, the main destruction method for cover crops and is a challenge i think uh for industry where where reliance on, cover, on glyphosate is, is particularly difficult um, things like flea beetle, I think there is lots of work going on, but I don't think we've got something that's specific yet to say uh, that cover crops or particular species of cover crops can help um, reduce flea beetle flashes, unfortunately. It'd be nice if we could. Are you back? Are you back again, Jasmine? Yes. Sorry, I disconnected. I think it started raining. <laughs> Did you answer Robin's question? I cut out before I got to ask it. Um, organic and carbon assessment methods and metrics. Did you answer that question? Yeah, we haven't looked at that one yet. No. Um, okay. Well, Robin <laughs> has asked which is the preferred carbon and organic assessment method and metric. Well, at Rothamsted, we're using um, leco-combustion 
to find total carbon in the soil. And when it's Broome's barn soil, we actually have to do um, inorganic carbon uh, with an acid uh, because there is visible limestone in the soils at depth. Uh, so we uh, remove the quantity of inorganic from the total. Lico gives you the total uh, and we take the inorganic away just to see organic carbon. Uh, we present that usually uh, as a, a proportion of the soil mass, but of course you can also then work with bulk density to look at the total carbon store in the soil. And we are measuring bulk density at the same time to, uh, to be able to do that. Okay, great. Well, I think we can finish the questions there. Before everyone goes, I just want to thank everyone for listening and for the questions. And if you'd like to sign up to the newsletter that Ian mentioned at the start, I have put the link in the chat and I've also put the email in as well. So if anyone thinks of any questions, please do not hesitate to email us at the CHC3 email. And we have got a five o'clock webinar coming up featuring flax and hemp on the 13th of December. If you would like to sign up, it's the same link as the newsletter. So thank you very much everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see you soon.